taken across the Irish Sea. Will we ever be set free? Hello, um, my name is Simon Egan and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Glasgow currently working on a project funded by the European Commission which looks at Ireland's changing relationship with Scotland from about the 13th century down to the end of the 16th century, looking in particular at how this relationship changes over, over time. Um, today I'll be speaking about uh, the Mortimer Earls of March in the late 14th century and where they fit into this kind of wider Gaelic milieu. In particular I'm looking at the Mortimer's attempts to recover their lands in Ireland, namely the Lordship of Connacht and the Earl of Ulster, and how their relationship with the various Irish families controlling their lands ultimately shaped their ambitions and their aims regarding the recovery of these lands. <coughs> okay. So, it's a well-known fact that the last three Mortimer Earls each perished in Ireland in the service of the English Crown. Edmund, the third Earl, um, following a campaign in Leinster, uh, was taken ill while <coughs> travelling south through the island from Clonmel to Cork. Um, he becomes ill sometime prior to arriving in the city, and he dies there on the 26th of December 1381. His body is then taken back to um, England, and he's interred in Wigmore Abbey. His lands then pass to his son, Roger, Forter. Um, now, Roger, fascinating character, is spurred on by the dynastic propaganda of the Welsh bard, Yolo Goch, and he comes to Ireland with Richard II in the 1390s, um, oops, very much intent on re-establishing his family's claims in Ireland, especially in Ulster, and conquering the O'Neills of Tyrone is one of his main goals. Again, so again, he's very much encouraged to do this by his Welsh bard. But, like his, um, like his father, um, Adam of Usk, the chronicler, had described his death, dying from an excess of military anger, <laughs> which I thought was quite a, quite a nice way of putting it, really. Um, but he's quite literally butchered to death um, near the Wicklow Mountains in 1398 by uh, the O'Burns. We'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. Anyway. His lands then pass to his own son, Edmund V Earl, who is beyond the scope of this paper, but I'd say a little bit about him. Again, fascinating character. He fights for the Lancastrian regime in France um, as a young man. He then returns to Ireland, or he comes to Ireland for the first time in 1423, when he's appointed to the office of Lord Deputy, so the most senior official in Ireland. And it's hoped that, as the most senior nobleman, he can end the factionalism that has plagued Irish politics, especially colonial politics, for the last number of decades. However, he too succumbs to plague five months after taking up his post in 1425. Okay. Now, none of the Mortimer Earls, the last three, live past the age of 32. And they each died in pursuit of their Irish inheritance, namely the Earldom of Ulster and the Lordship of Connacht. They inherited these lands in the late 1360s, and we'll look at this in more detail shortly. But just to say a little bit about current scholarship on the Mortimers. They feature prominently among the dramatis personae of late 14th and early 15th century Ireland. So the work of James Lydon, uh, Jocelyn Otway Rubin, Art Cosgrove, they're there, um, they feature prominently as Lord Deputies, as senior nobles, military commanders, um, etc. They have quite a prominent place in Irish historiography. However, the focus is largely on their tenure as, as I said, Lord Deputies, military commanders. Our scholarship is focused on their relations with the colonial nobility, powerful families such as the Butlers uh, of Ormond, etc. The Earls of Ormond. But aside from two recent pieces by Catherine Sims and Brendan Smith, little attention has been devoted to exploring the, the Mortimer Earls' relations with the Gaelic nobility and also how developments within the Gaelic speaking world, that's 
most of Ireland and the West Highlands and Islands of Scotland, how developments in these regions shaped the Mortimer's um, ambitions and their efforts at reclaiming their Irish land. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Okay, <coughs> so the aim of this paper is to reassess the Mortimer's attempts to recover their Irish lands from the perspective of their relations with the Gaelic nobility. Primarily the Gaelic Irish nobility, but we'll also talk a little bit about the Gaelic Scottish nobility, where they fit into all this. Okay, so this includes briefly tracing the history of the Earl of Ulster and Lordship of Connacht, the lands claimed by the Mortimers, outlining how these lands come into the Mortimers' possession, the claims at least, as I said, exploring their relations with the Gaelic nobility, and examining how all this <coughs> shapes their efforts at recovering these lands. Okay. So we'll be weaving through quite a densely networked lineage-based world of late medieval Ireland and Scotland. We're going to look at quite a few dynasties and the relations of one another. But, and this is kind of the, the health warning, I have plenty of maps, so that should, should hopefully help. Fingers crossed. Okay. So, going back to the period Colin was looking at. Again, that's quite general, but uh, it's a well-known fact that Ireland is invaded in 1169. I've got a little bit earlier, if you count the bit of it, sorry. My apologies, my apologies. Um, over the course of the late 12th to 13th centuries, large areas of the island are conquered and colonised. Um, with large areas of the island are settled, we get the establishment of a manorial style system. We get the creation of numerous new lordships encompassing a large section of the island, and we get the introduction or creation of new, a new caste of colonial dynasties, um, the De Lacy's, um, the Fitzgeralds, the De Birmingham's, the Butler's, many more. The ruling order in pre-invasion Ireland, the Gaelic nobility, they are pushed back to the more rugged, mountainous areas of the island. These families include the, the O'Neills of Tyrone, um, the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell, the O'Connors of Connacht, the O'Briens of Thomond, to name just some of the four main families at this time. Now, maps are on the way, so hang on. Right, yes, no, no, no. Um, so, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus on two key regions, Connacht and Ulster. Okay. So, the Earl of Ulster and the Lords of Connacht. Okay. So Ulster is conquered in the late 12th century. John de Courcy um, becomes the first Lord of Ulster. He's not the Earl of Ulster, he's the first Lord of Ulster. Okay. So this is, on the map here, this is roughly, um, yes, larger boundaries are approximate, another health warning. Um, but Ulster, this is, this is the area, the Earl of Ulster, plus lands that are kind of that fall within the, um, the, the hegemony of the Lord of Ulster under the Courcy, and then subsequently the, Earl, the Earls of Ulster. But anyway, the Courcy falls from grace in the early 1200s, um, and Hugh de Lacy um, is made first Earl of Ulster by King John in 1205. Okay, and under de Lacy, during this period, the early 13th century, the influence of the Earls of Ulster extends, and the rest of the province it kind of, it, it, it falls within their ambit. These lands, the western section of the province, are also claimed by the Earls at this time. Now, De Lacy, he also falls foul of King John. Uh, he's forced into exile, and he goes on the Albigensian Crusade in southern France. But he is eventually restored in 1227. Now, he dies in 1242, having come back to Ireland. He has no legitimate issue, so he's no legitimate heirs and the earldom, to all intents and purposes, passes into the hands of the English crown. Okay, what's going on in Connacht while all this is happening? Well, <clears throat> the English are expanding west of the Shannon from the, um, from the early 1220s onwards, so Shannon cuts down through the middle of the country and they're expanding in this region here. And they're focused on carrying up the old O'Connor kingdom. Now, 
During this period, the, the 13th century, two main colonial families emerge here. Um, the Geraldines are the Fitzgeralds and the De Burrs. We're going to focus on the latter, the De Burrs. So, by the late 13th century, the De Burrs. Oh, sorry. Hello. By the late 13th century, the De Burrs have emerged as the dominant force in Connacht, and they play a leading role in wider Irish politics. Um, these are the lands which more or less come into their possession over the course of the 13th century. Okay. 1263, Walter de Burr, who is Lord Connacht, he is granted the Earldom of Ulster by um, Edward I. So he becomes the major landowner in, um, in Irish politics. So he has control of the lordships in Connacht as well as the Earldom of Ulster and the lands claimed by the Earl of Ulster at this time. Okay. So, now, following Walter's death, his son and heir, Richard de Burr, uh, that's wrong, that should be, instead of dying in 1236, it should be 3026, my apologies there. Um, following his death in 1271, his son and heir, Richard de Burr, <coughs> inherits both the Lordship of Connacht and the Earl of Ulster. He has an enormous territorial jurisdiction across the island. Nearly half the island is technically within his sphere of influence. So, so he's a really senior figure in both Irish politics and wider British politics, if you like. Um, he's close ties to the English crown at this time, um, but he also has strong connections in Scotland. Um, a marriage alliance is organised with the Bruce family in Scotland. Uh, his daughter, Elizabeth de Borough, she marries Robert Bruce, the future King of Scots, in 1302. Okay, so late 13th century, very early 14th century, the English position in Ireland is constantly increasing, the power of the colonial nobility is being consolidated. But this all begins to change in the, <coughs> in the early 14th century. Firstly, the outbreak and exacerbation of Anglo-Scottish hostilities places severe pressure on the de Burgh's position in Ireland. The English colony in Ireland, including the Earl of Ulster, they sent several expeditions to fight the Scots in the, 12, the late 1290s and the early 1300s. And while this does allow Edward I to um, gain the military advantage over the Scots, it does deplete the colony's resources in Ireland. Right? So the, the colony is now pouring its resources into a Scottish war, taking resources away from the defence of Ireland. Colin touched on the Bruce invasions, 1315 to 1318, um, hit Ireland. They also impact most heavily upon the Earl of Ulster, so that's Ulster is where the Bruce brothers invade. It's naturally the region of Ireland uh, most affected by the Bruce invasion. Um, we saw a little bit of Open Collins' paper how the colonial government under Roger Markmer fought the Bruces during this period. Um, oh dear. Oh, there we go. Um, Richard de Burr, um, the Earl of Ulster, he was suspected of sympathising with his son in law, Robert Bruce, the King of Scots but he does play an important role in fighting them at this time. Okay, so the first point is the outbreak of Anglo-Scottish wars weakens the Bruce position, sorry, weakens the position of the Earls of Ulster in Ireland. Secondly, the Bruce invasions coincide with the great European famine of 1315-22. This affects the entirety of Northern Europe. It has, has a major impact upon local populations. We also get the advent of the Little Ice Age, which is a period of global cooling. Over the course of the early 14th century, the growing season sharpens by about a year, so it's quite significant. Um, there's a shorter growing season, uh, crops aren't as readily available, and large areas of the colony in Ireland begin to revert to woodland, okay? So 
So this is in part due to the, the Bruce invasions, the destruction caused by those invasions, but also there are naturally occurring phenomena such as famine and medieval climate change shaping the, the landscape in Ireland. Okay, so the colony is hit badly, particularly in Ulster. The de Burgh lordships in Connacht survived the ravages of the early 14th century, but the earldom is decimated at this time. And by the 1320s, Richard de Burgh has more or less given up hope of recovering his lands in Ulster. Okay. Following his death in 13, 1326, uh, his lands passed to his grandson, William. Now, William is very active in Irish and English politics, very close relationship with King Edward III, and there's evidence, strong evidence to suggest that both Edward and William planned to lead a major expedition to Ireland in 1331-1332, okay? So the Crown is very much concerned about what's taking place in Ireland. They feel that there is a pressing need for a major royal military intervention there. However, the outbreak of a second war with Scotland um, in 1332 sees this plan scuppered. And Edward III diverts the military resources which were supposed to go to Ireland. They're all put into supporting Edward Balliol, who is a claimant to the kingship of the Scots. So he's, um, his father, John, had been made king of Scots um, in 1292 by Edward I. He's then deposed by Edward I in 1295. Um, so Edward is his, his son, um, Edward Bailey is his son, Edward III decides to use him as a puppet against the Scots at this time. So, so in conclusion to that part, William, Earl of Ulster, does not get the resources he needs. And as Robin Frame suggested, had Ireland received the kind of major military investment it needed from the Crown at this time, things would have been very, very different. That's not what happens though. Okay, the third point. William, Earl of Ulster, is murdered by his tenants in 1333. He's survived by his wife, Mathilda, who's also known as Maud in the sources, and his daughter, Elizabeth. Okay, both flee to England at this time, where they begin lobbying for royal assistance to recover their lands. Now, <clears throat> Elizabeth de Burgh, who is William, the recently deceased William, and Matilda's daughter, that should say the throat, it says father, which is... I guess that's a message in itself, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know how Mark Armour feel about that, but um, anyway. Um, so he's the throat to Prince Lionel, um, second son of Edward III, in 1341. Okay, so she gets a very prestigious royal marriage. We'll say a little bit more more about that shortly. <coughs> Elizabeth de Clare, who is William's mother, she remarries the Irish justiciar, uh, Ralph Dufford. Okay, so um, he's a senior figure within the colonial government. So the Crown is interested in Ireland, but there's one major problem. The context of the Hundred Years' War means that Edward III can't send the men and resources to Ireland needed not only to recover the Borough lands, but also to, um, uh, to prop the colony up more generally. So they've had a war with Scotland, which is still ongoing, um, and the outbreak of the war in France sees England stretched on two fronts. So Ireland is a concern for the, the English crown, but it's not the main concern. France, France really is the concern, Scotland is secondary, and then Ireland is in third position, I would suggest. Okay. But the failure to act in Ireland at this crucial juncture has major repercussions for both Irish and English politics. And ultimately, the fact that the English crown is distracted with the situation in France, this is a major factor contributing to the political recovery of the Gaelic order in Ireland. Okay. So just on the map before we get going, these are the lands which were claimed by Held and then claimed by the Deborahs 
that were girls in the late 13th and early 14th century. Yeah, so this is, this is roughly their territorial jurisdiction um, circa 1300. It's a little bit bigger than this, but it, uh, just to give you a sense that these are the lands that they can, they enjoy either direct control over or military influence over, okay? So, following the, following the, the ravages of the early 14th century, the, um, these various lands are seized by various dynasties in Ireland. So in Ulster, the, um, the earldom of Ulster is subsumed into the growing power of two dominant Gaelic Irish lordships, the O'Neills of Tyrone, who are in brown, and the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell in green. Further south in Connacht, um, as I mentioned, the Burg lordships, they survive the period of the Bruce invasions, but the death of William, the last Earl, in 1333, sees the de Burlands split into two. Two competing branches, uh, Burke of Mayo and Burke of Clan Rickard. Now, really important point here is that both these branches are heavily Gaelicized. They begin styling themselves as de Burka or Burke, which are hibernicizations of the surname de Burr. So, um, it's kind of a marker of their assimilation, integration into the socio-cultural world of Gaelic Ireland, okay? So, ultimately, this means that they have weaker ties to the government in Dublin and weaker ties still to the government in England. So, by 1360, as we'll see in the map shortly, most of the island is now controlled by a patchwork of families, um, including the O'Connors of Connacht, who are resurgent at this time, the O'Briens of Thomond, the Fitzgerald Earldom of Desmond, which was created in the 1320s, the McCarthy's of Desmond, again another powerful uh, Gaelic Irish family, the Butler Earldom of Ormond, again created in the early 14th century, the Macmurray Cavanaghs of Leinster, the old Kings of Leinster we heard about in the previous paper, and what's left here, because I, I ran out of space with the uh, the labels, but kind of colonial power becomes centred on the east coast of Ireland. This is the Earldom of Kildare, which helps protect um, the colony. A little bit of Wexford down here as well. Um, and it's kind of this is kind of my my excuse. There's a, a, a host of different little lordships here in the middle in this uh, this white section. Just trust me on that. Um, okay. Now, of these families, some such as the Butlers are quite loyal to the English crown and quite effective at maintaining English power and influence. The Kildare's similar, but the further west one goes, the royal influence, royal authority, the effective exercise of royal authority, I should say, becomes weaker, okay? It's virtually non-existent in the Gaelic areas and it can be very, very weak within, um, within even the Earldom of Desmond. Okay, so it's a, it's a complex picture we have here. Okay, so it's not until the 1360s that Edward III is able to turn his attention to Ireland. Okay, within the context of the Hundred Years' War, there is um, there's a peace treaty in 1360. Edward wins a major battle at Poitiers in 1356, um, leading to the peace treaty of 1360. And he can finally turn his attention to his western satellite. Okay, so for the first time in 30 years, the Crown is in a position to have a look at what's going on in Ireland. So, Prince Lionel, who had bothered the throat, Elizabeth de Burgh in uh, 1341, uh, is appointed Lord Deputy of Ireland. He sent there uh, with an army the plan being the recovery of Ulster and Connacht. He is the senior English nobleman in Ireland, so the idea is that he can not only draw upon, draw upon the resources of the English crown, but he can also um, marshal the resources of the colonial nobility as a royal prince and the senior English nobleman in Ireland. Okay. The expedition is not really as successful, I would say. He leads a few campaigns, um, mainly in Leinster. Um, he's most famous for issuing the infamous 
statutes of Kilkenny interpreting in 67, which were an attempt to limit interaction between the Irish and the colonial nobility. So prescribing marriage, fosterage, um, speaking Irish, um, dressing in the Irish manner, um, those statutes have very, very little effect because a lot of the colonial nobility in Ireland, as Colin said in the previous paper, um, it's a complex picture. They're dependent on maintaining alliances with their Irish neighbours, they draw a lot of power from their Irish neighbours, so the statutes do fall kind of flat. Lionel also departs for Italy um, in the late 1360s. For, uh, he's marrying a new bride, Violenta, um, who is the daughter of the Lord of Milan. Um, so it's part of a kind of, Edward III is kind of moving away from Ireland, he's looking at the kind of broader European picture once again. Elizabeth, his former wife, had also died in 1363. He himself dies in 1368. So again, the kind of period of direct royal intervention in the 16, in the 1360s, success, not, it, it, it was not really successful in the grand scheme of things. And very quickly, the crown is looking once more back to Europe, back to the broad situation, the relations with France, the relations with Scotland. Okay, but before his death, um, <clears throat> Lionel arranges the marriage of his daughter Philippa to Edmund Mar Mortimer III, Earl of March. And with this marriage, and following Lionel's death, Edmund inherits what Robin Frame has called the largest property portfolio in the British Isles. So a huge collection of lands in Ireland, Wales and England. One of the really senior figures within um, the British Isles at this time. Okay, so the main point is that the Crown has now delegated the recovery of these Irish lands, Ulster and Connacht, to the Markhamer family. Okay, so <clears throat> Edmund is granted livery of his Irish lands by Edward III in 1369, so a year after Lionel has died and Edmund has in, excuse me, inherited the claims to these lands. For the next 10 years, Edmund pursues a very active military career in Scotland, France, and Brittany. Following a request from the Irish Council, so the kind of the ruling council in Dublin, the, the colonial council, he is appointed Lord Deputy of Ireland. And prior to taking up his post, he has a long list of chapters to lands in Ireland drawn up. So his big collection of all the chapters um, all the lands claimed by the De Burrs put together, um, making a statement that he wants these lands recovered. But really interestingly, and Catherine Simmons has drawn attention to this, um, he also includes a lot of the older agreements that the Burrs, the De Burrs enjoyed with the Irish chieftains, so all these earlier agreements of vassalage, um, submission, etc. So it's clear that Edmund coming to Ireland has a very clear goal in mind. He's not only coming as the senior noble, the senior official in Irish affairs, he's also coming to reclaim these lands and re-establish the, um, um, the old de Burg hegemony across much of Ireland. So Ulster is the main objective. Okay. So he arrives in Ireland in October 1379. He marches north and establishes his base at Downpatrick, which was the old capital of colonial Ulster in the 13th century. Over the course of the early spring of 1380, he received submissions from several families, including the O'Neills, the O'Reillys who are in white here, sorry, the O'Hanlons and the McGuinness families. So kind of families within this cluster here in, in eastern Ulster. Uncertain if these submissions were given willingly. Um, for example, when the McGuinness chieftain submitted to Edmund, Edmund had him seized and thrown in a dungeon in Trim Castle, where he dies three years later. Okay, so there is a strong degree of coercion involved here. He also led a campaign across Ulster, all the way to the boundaries of Tyrconnell here, sometime in the spring of 1380. Um, so it's clear that this is a this kind of it's at sore point a lot of these submissions I would think. However, 
he is the Lord Deputy of Ireland, as well as being the, the Earl of Ulster. So he has to, um, he's a lot of work to do basically. He, ha he has to attend to his duties in the rest of the island. So he's forced to lead campaigns down south here into kind of um, eastern Leinster against um, the O'Toole's of Burns um, in the course of the 1380s. But um, the situation in Munster, the growing power of the O'Brien family, he's forced to lead an expedition south into Munster to Clonmel here, where he holds a general council in autumn 1381, with the intention of leading um, a spring campaign in 1382 into Thomond here against the O'Briens. However, as we saw on his journey south to Cork, um, he becomes ill some kind of a fever, I think, and he dies on Christmas Day, St. Stephen's Day, 1381. Okay. So any progress made under Edmund is very quickly undone, and his lands pass to his, uh, his infant son, Roger. So Roger is born in 1374. He's another hugely important figure within British politics, within the wider affairs of Ireland, England, and further afield. He's heir to a vast network of Irish lordships across the archipelago. So a vast network of lordships across the archipelago, Ireland, Wales, and England. But owing to his age, he's only born in 1374, he's unable to pursue the recovery of these lands until the 1390s. Okay? So the, con the kind of momentum generated by his father and by Lionel of Clarence to some extent is broken in the 1380s. Also, he is a potential heir to the English crown should Richard II um, die childless. So again, he has this kind of, um, he's not only important for his lands, but in terms of dynastic politics in England, he is quite important. And the fact that he's a potential claimant to the English throne, the fact that he has a lot of lands in England, Wales and Ireland, that makes him even more important because he can raise troops from these lands. Anyway, he's knighted by Richard in 1390. He receives livery of his Irish, Welsh, and English lands in 1393, and he serves as the ambassador on the Anglo-Scottish borders in 1394. He travels to Ireland with Richard II in October 1394. Now, <clears throat> Richard planned to use the recovery of the Mortimer lands in Ulster and Connacht as uh, a vehicle for bolstering English power and influence within the wider British Isles. Um, so both Roger and Richard's aims and objectives regarding Ireland, I would suggest, are intertwined at this time. Not identical, they do diverge at some points, but um, broadly speaking, both are interested in recovering the lands. Okay. So Richard spends a little over seven months in Ireland. He's the last head of state to visit Ireland prior to Oliver Cromwell in the 1640s and the last monarch to travel to Ireland prior to James II and William III in the 1690s. His expedition to Ireland in 1394-95 is significant to say the least. About 8,000 men are part of, the, um, part of the venture. And from December 1394 to April 1395, Richard receives a submission of over 80 Gaelic-Irish and Anglo-Irish colonial lords. Now, important, the lords who submitted to Richard were not a feckless rabble of disorganized lords. That's really important, as we'll see quite shortly. Okay? Rather, the submissions were a carefully orchestrated event coordinated by four powerful families in Ireland. The O'Neills of Tyrone, the O'Connor Down Kindred of Connacht, so they're a branch of the O'Connor family, the Burks of Clan Rickard, and the O'Briens of Thomond. These families, interest, interestingly so, were each allied to one another, and between them, they controlled a huge section of the island, at least a third. And they also controlled um, the majority of the lands claimed by the Mortimers at this time, okay? So just to find them out again, we've got the O'Neill to Tyrone, um, the O'Connor Down Kindred, who are kind of the southern half um, of the O'Connor Lordship here, the Burks of Clanricard, and the O'Briens of Thomond. Okay, even though Thomond is beyond the reach, it, it's not in, it's not part of the, the old 
the borderlands, it still it, it, it does border with them here. Okay. So Richard II hopes to believe that, but well, what I would suggest, believe that the recovery of the Mortimer lands rested on building a better relationship with these four powerful families. The Irish, interestingly so, also display a willingness to engage and negotiate with Richard at this time. For example, O'Neill, O'Connor Down, O'Brien and Burke of Clanricard are each knighted by Richard in 1395. O'Connor Down um, was awarded the Constabulary of Roscommon Castle and he's admitted to English law. So on one level Richard might have been laying the groundwork for an expedition into Connacht against the Burks of Mayo to shore up English authority there. But at the same time, and similar to what Colin said about um, Mortimer and the O'Moores granting them, granting them Dunamass Castle where, when they already controlled it, Roscommon Castle has been lost to the Irish for about 50 years by this point. So Richard is just kind of confirming what is already a, a reality at this time. But Richard's most interested in Ulster, and securing the cooperation of the O'Neills is critical. The O'Neills are also very keen to work with Richard. The question is why? They're certainly fearful, I would think, of Roger's ambitions. For example, they write a letter to Richard saying, basically, and the quote is something like, please be our shield against the Earl of March at this time, okay? That, that's certainly one factor. They've seen how Roger's father, Edmund, led several campaigns in Ulster in 1380. Um, so there's certainly, the fear of the Mortimers is certainly one factor, but there's also an, another one which we talk about now. In order to do so, we just need to step back for a moment and look at the, um, the kind of the, the wider archipelagic picture. So, oops. So, as I said, uh, O'Neill, uh, O'Connor Down, Burke and O'Brien, the majority of the 80 submissions are orchestrated by these lords. Um, so, under these four lords, there's a host of smaller families within their lordships, and it's through them, it's through their agency, they convince their underlings, their vassals, their Gaelic vassals, to submit to Richard at this time. But, they're also diametrically opposed by another alliance block in Ireland, which comprises the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell, the Burks of Mayo, and the O'Connor Rua kindred, who are kind of the top half of the O'Connor lordship here. This is quite worrying from Richard's perspective, because the O'Donnells have an alliance with the Scottish Crown, who are at war with England, or at least hostile to England, and the papal schism of the late 14th century, which is the division of the papacy between Rome and Avignon, Tyrconnell, Mayo, and O'Connor, and this region of Connacht all support the Avignon papacy as well. So we get the mapping of these European alliance networks, the context of the Hundred Years' War. Ireland is, to some extent, part of this, part of this wider European world. In comparison, so you've got O'Donnell, Burke of Mayo, O'Connor Rua, and a few more who are not on this map. They all support the Avignon papacy. The O'Neills, the O'Connor Down, Clan Rickard, O'Brien support the Roman papacy. So it's kind of split down the middle in some respects. So we're seeing some very interesting things happening in Ireland at this time. But the key point is that the O'Donnells have an alliance with the Scottish Crown just across the water, and that the papal legate for Avignon is based in Glasgow, and he's sending messages to clerics on the west coast of Ireland at this time. Okay, so that's just a bit of the wider context. There's also a further Scottish dimension to this. Okay, this is the best map I could do with sharp numbers, I'm sorry. Um, since the 1330s, the English Crown has negotiated successive alliances with the MacDonald Lordship of the Isles. So, basically, by, by the early 15th century, the MacDonalds control all these territories in, um, kind of in grey here. Um, the reason for this alliance is it's partly to open a second front against the Scots during the Hundred Years' War, but it's also to protect English holdings in the Irish Sea. So, for example, 
The English still controlled the kind of east coast of Ulster, but over the course of the 14th century, it's regularly raided by Scottish pirates, by French pirates. Having an alliance with the Macdonalds means they can protect these lands more effectively. During the 1380s and 1390s, during kind of the lull in Markhamer interest in Ireland, because Roger is um, he's a minor, Richard's government um, helps the Macdonald dynasty acquire possession of the seven kings of Antrim, which are located here. Okay, so they actually give the Macdonalds lands in Ulster. That means the Macdonalds become a permanent part of the Irish political landscape. There's also evidence that the Macdonalds ally themselves with the O'Neills in central Ulster. So the main reason, but there's a couple of reasons for it, but the main reason is the Scottish Crown does not like the Macdonalds. The Scottish Crown has an alliance with the O'Donnells. The O'Donnells don't like the O'Neills. So it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Basically, that's what happens at, at this time. Okay, but from an English perspective, from Richard's perspective, He's got alliances with the O'Neills, their Irish allies, and he's also got an alliance with the MacDonald Lordship of the Isles, which is a hugely powerful entity in British politics at this time. Okay. So just turning to Roger Mortimer very quickly. So from Richard's perspective, the recovery of the Mortimer lands form a key component uh, in this wider insular strategy. Now, Roger probably concurred with this but he also had his own ambitions in Ulster. Now, Brendan Smith has done a lot to rehabilitate Roger's image, and he suggests that Roger is not kind of, um, he's not, I suppose, he doesn't have a bipolar, black and white approach to Gaelic Ireland. He's actually quite acculturated. He understands some of the nuances of Irish society at this time. It's what maybe leads to his death. We'll talk about that very, very quickly at the end. But at the same time, Roger, um, He's a dynast. He's a noble. He spurred on, um, as I mentioned, by the poetry of Yolo Gok, the Welsh bard, who urges him to subdue that Ulster dog, basically to subdue O'Neill, to reassert your family's claims upon Ulster, um, etc., etc. So again, he's um, he's a complex figure. He is, on one level, very, very important from the crown's point of view, but he is also a noble with his own dynastic and political ambitions in Ireland. And following Richard's departure, Roger leads a series of raids upon uh, the O'Neills and their allies, and they even burn the cathedral at Armagh. So Richard has just finished concluding all these very important treaties with the O'Neills, and Roger places huge pressure on them. Right? So the O'Neills find it difficult to trust him. He does succeed in kind of cowing the O'Neills for a period, but this kind of has a very detrimental impact upon the English position in Ireland. For example, a weak O'Neill lordship means that the O'Donnells can run riot in this period, um, which they do. So while Roger is kind of raiding the O'Neills in the east, the O'Donnells start picking apart the O'Neills in the west. And Roger's activities, just to kind of very briefly touch on this, they also have a destabilizing impact on the southern section of the island. Roger has close ties with James Butler, who was the fifth Earl of Ormond. Just a bit of kind of interesting information. Ormond Butler, he acted as the interpreter for Richard II when Richard was meeting all the Irish chieftains in 1394-95. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite an, an important job, and one needs to be incredibly fluent in Irish to do this. But James Butler, very senior English nobleman, is able to do this. He acts as the interpreter for Richard during this time. But Armand is also feuding with um, the other Desmond, Gerald Fitzgerald at this time, and wants to undercut Desmond's position. There's evidence that Roger helps Armand um, do this, and to persuade Richard to create a new earldom in Cork here for Edward Albemarle, the, um, the Earl of Rutland. So there's a new earldom here which kind of undercuts Desmond's power base in, um, in Munster. Now, this naturally backfires, and Desmond, in the late 1390s, forges an alliance with the McMurray Cavanaghs, and they catch Ormond in the center, um, in which turns out to be quite a na nasty war. So, again, 
Rogers' kind of dynastic ambitions, they, they do have quite, quite, quite a, a problematic impact, to say the least, uh, on Irish politics at this time. Anyway, just, just to conclude. So, Roger, as I mentioned at the beginning of the paper, he is himself cut down during a skirmish against the O'Burns in the Wicklow Mountains in July 1398. But he's dressed as an Irishman, according to primary sources, um, when he's killed. And Brendan Smith suggests that rather than viewing Roger solely through the lens of an aggressive colonial lord in Ireland, we should perhaps see him as a more complex figure capable of negotiating the dynastic and intercultural inter world of Gaelic Ireland. So the idea that he's dressed in the manner of an Irish lord suggests that, you know, may maybe he's, he was, um, I suppose, trying to portray himself in a more accessible light, in a more favor favorable light to potential vassals, to potential allies. Anyway, this is certainly true. Um, the Martin Earl's relationship with Ireland and the wider Gaelic-speaking world which includes Scotland, was indeed more complex. But I think it's also fair to say that developments in this Gaelic world could also impact and impinge upon both the Martimers and the ambitions of the English crown. So ultimately, in addition to paying more closer attention to the Martimers, we should perhaps be paying closer attention to this Gaelic world as well. Thank you. Free.